Well, it's the end of the year. Time for us YouTubers to do some wrapping up. I've decided to be really lazy and just talk about my favorite five watches released in 2022. A couple of points. It's my favorites. It's not the best. I actually disagree with the very concept of there being a best watch, so I'm not going to try and do that. Instead, I'm just going to talk about my personal favorites. The key here is... Um, I'm intellectually interested in super high-end watches, but not really emotionally invested in them. So really high-end watches, they might be fantastic, they're great, but they're not going to make my favorite list. The second point I'd make is because these are my favorite watches and my favorite watches are always in the price range that's relevant to me, there's a very high likelihood that if you've made my favorite list, I may have bought one or two of them. And the third thing is in making this list, I've kind of drawn up an arbitrary rule, only one watch per brand. So terribly sorry, Breitling Navitimer, you're going to have to miss out. You probably deserve a spot on this list, but that rule kicks you out. So all that said, after the intro, let's get into my five favorite watches released in 2022. Okay, so we're going to start at number five with a big hitter, something that's probably just on the edge of what I might one day see myself spending, but can't do it right now. And that is the Parmigiani Tonda PF GMT Rotra, Rotra Pont. Um, first off, it's a cool brand and it's fantastic to see Parmigiani making a comeback. It's a beautiful Tonda PF case with intricate dial work, distinctive bracelet, a really, really pretty movement. Added to that, a really unique and uniquely romantic GMT function. Travel watches usually emphasize the departure. They, they put a lot of effort into making it easy to separate your home time and your local time. This watch does something really interesting. It's a watch almost designed for the travel weary and the homesick. It's put all of its clever into allowing the watch to bring your local time, snap it back to your home time with the press of a button. You can bring yourself back to your family and friends. You can come together. You can, in the literal translation, translation pont. And there's something really nice about that. And months later, this watch continues to just stick in my head. And for that reason, it makes the top five favorite watches of the year. Next, I have the Ulysse Nadar Torpillier uh, Dual Time. I've got a really soft spot for Ulysse Nadar. They are unfashionable and unloved, and they do some really weird stuff like their erotic watches. But they constantly come up with strange ideas that tempt me. The Freak, for example, just draws me in and says, here's a watch that just seems to be something special from a watchmaker that's sort of happy to sort of find their own way, do their own thing. As a travel watch buff and someone who likes to collect, you know, watches that evoke the idea of travel, their dual time movement, and particularly the way it combines with a big date, is always fascinating and frankly I always keep an eye out for the watches with that movement and I will have one one day. This movement has recently been turning up in the blast range from Yuli Snada and it's not really caught with me but take that movement put it in the marine chronometer the torpillia case and suddenly for me this is a complication and a movement and a watch that really comes to life it's something that says this has got a place in my collection funnily enough the chronometer on its own the marine chronometer on its own probably wouldn't do it either that would probably not be enough to warrant having a place in my collection but here it's a case of I think the dual time complication and that big date is bringing enough visual interest enough horological interest that this is a watch that I could really get behind I'm hoping it hangs around for a little bit giving me time to perhaps on the secondary market prices the drop may be able to afford it 
even better, I would love to see UN bring this out in a slightly different colorway. If they could bring it out with a white dial, blue subdial, and gold accents as they have on their Panda version, this watch would be killer. Okay, so watch number three on my top five this year, the Bulgari Octo Finissimo Sejima Special Edition. The Octo Finissimo for me is a watch that is an embodiment of the idea of an architectural watch. When you look at the, the Octo Finissimo, it recalls the angles, the geometry, the feeling of presence of structures, of buildings, of architecture. That circular dial planted in a shallow and expanding field of octagons reminds me of a building, or perhaps more than that, a plinth, not the sculpture itself, but rather the basis upon which you would build a sculpture. And perhaps that's the reason, that's the, the sort of underlying feel that the Octo Finissimo brings that makes it such a great uh, basis for collabs with architects. There's been a number of these sort of collabs with architects, and I think the Octo always sings in those. The Sujima Special Edition is a perfect example of how that works. This watch has taken all of the ideas of that avant-garde Japanese architect, all the things that we see out there in the real world, and then translated it and brought it into a fun, daring, playful, outlandish but polished, in all sorts of meanings of the word, watch, shrunk it down and put these amazing buildings at the disposal of an individual, no matter where you are and what you're doing. And I love that. Now, I strongly suspect that there could be a Bulgari um, uh, Octo collab on this list of top five every year I ever do one. But you know what? That is what it is. And this year, it would be the, the Sejima. Okay, so, so far I've done five, four, and three. Let you in on the secret. There are two number ones. I cannot split them. My first number one is this. It is that one. The Jajula Cult Polaris uh, with the Degradé Green Dial. I have loved Jajula Cult as a manufacturer since I got into watches. The whole... Not only just is it the watchmaker's watchmaker thing, which is, you know, so cool, but secondly, parts of their history, like the idea that these guys made watches for years before it even occurred to them that, hey, we should be branding this and selling it and trying to make, you know, trying to build a marketing site. The fact that they named it after themselves, so, you know, in a, in a, you know, something which is largely unpronounceable um, and really difficult to say and huge, and it doesn't fit well on a dial. There's something really charming and, and, anti-consumerist about that, which I absolutely adore. So I've wanted to want a JLCs from the moment I got into this hobby. The Reverso is great and I will have one one day, but it's never quite got over the line as something I really wanted now and would spend my money on. From the moment the Polaris came out, I knew that the Polaris was it. The Polaris had that sense of being the watchmaker's watch that fits within my lifestyle and how I saw it. But whenever I got on hand with the original blue and black dial ones, there wasn't enough there. There was It was a watch I admired. It was handsome. It was very solid, but it never tempted me to the point that I would be handing over money until I saw the green dial. And suddenly with the green dial, Everything that was missing, that drama, that love, that joie de vivre, that desire to just, that has to be mine. I have to wear that, suddenly snapped into place. And that's why from the moment I saw the first renderings of the Green Dial, I needed to see one on in person. From the moment I saw an exhibition version at the, the boutique, that very day, I went back to the boutique and put down my deposit and was waiting for one to arrive. As I said, the, the Polaris is for me a great basis that's always needed that little extra. And with the green dial, you've got all of that in spades. This was 
So this was absolutely my favorite release of the year and something I couldn't wait to get right up until my other number one. And my other number one watch of the year is this. It is the Breitling Super Ocean 44 Bronze. I've made no secret of the fact I'm something of a Breitling fanboy these days. I'm loving the direction of the company and what it's doing. Their concepts of luxury being fun and casual, inclusive, etc. They all resonate with me. They make me feel they they are the sorts of things I want in something that makes me feel good. They're the sorts of things I want when I'm being luxurious. And so Brightwing is giving me exactly the sorts of things I want to get with that. So when the Super Ocean was released, I was primed to like it. The way they're structuring themselves is likely to resonate with me. And that this watch embodies all of those ideals is perfect. This watch, the new Super Ocean, unlike the other Super Ocean, the, the one it just replaced and so many other watches, is not the dive watch you pack so that you can go on your weeks-long diving expedition, then spend hours prepping for a dive down deep with all your gear. This is the dive watch that you have sitting on the kitchen counter or sitting on your bedside table that you grab on a whim when you've decided to run out and have a quick surf with no other planning. It's not the watch that you put on so that you can go back to the casino at the resort and have cocktails while you're all dressed up. It's the watch that you keep wearing after you've been surfing, standing around the bonfire on the beach. It is everything I think of is luxury. All that other stuff for me is work. I do that because I have to, because there might be some business thing. But if I can just hang out and do what I want, when I want, it's go to the beach or go up to the mountains or jump on my bike whenever I feel like it, grabbing something that's fun and then rolling into whatever cafe or barbecue or pub is open at the time and has a good burger. And for me, that is luxury. And for me, the Super Ocean this year, Breitling's iteration of the new one, just nailed it. It is fun and casual luxury shrunk down and put into a watch. That it comes in bronze, which then patinas and gives you that slightly weather-worn look, just is the cherry on the top. Okay, so that's it. They're my favorite watches of the year. Probably, given my definition of favorite, especially opposed to best, unsurprising that I've bought two of the five. That kind of, it's kind of like it would be shocking if I bought watches, but they weren't in my favorites list. How would that work? What about yours? What are your favorite watches of the year? If you want to tell me what you think your best watches of the year were, go right ahead, but I'm not really that interested. What I really want to know are what are the ones that you really wanted, that you were emotionally connected to? Stick it in the comments below. We'll have a chat about it. I've been Pete McConville. This has been my channel where I talk about watches, like, subscribe, do all that sort of stuff. I will see you later. Bye.